Cancel culture. It's everywhere because it had started in the media and it became such a thing and then it moved into social media. And then as we watched public figures go through this seeming uh, ostracization and you've been banished to a corner of shame as we as just regular individuals who aren't uh, – you know, in the news every day and, and everybody doesn't know our name and, and, and we're watching all of this and, and, and you can't see all of this happen without having some sense of concern that may even border on fear that if you were to say something, uh, in a weak moment or say something that sounded one way and you didn't mean it that way, and we've all fallen victim to that, right? Where we've said something with a tone and we didn't mean it that way, or we actually said something and it came across one way. We didn't mean it that way. But whatever the circumstance is, when you see what has happened in our country on social media, it happens right in front of you, uh, in the media, you start to go, this could happen to me. I could be seen as a jerk or unpleasant person. I might get punished at work or even fired. Now, why are we in this situation? Because never before have we seen people have so much freedom without consequence to share how offended they are. Social media has changed the game. The stuff that people say on social media under the banner of you offended me and so now I can respond it's shocking because most people not all but most people will type something that they wouldn't say face to face now you've got this lunatic fringe and 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 this is not by the way it's not exclusive to any one uh side of the political aisle or spiritual aisle or whatever you want to say here. It's just, it is a person who is so unhealthy, borderline, you know, mental illness or full on mental illness that will say some really damaging and violent, do violent things. So that's a very small percentage of our population. But what is not a small percentage uh, are people who are so easily offended and they will take it out on you and seek to, you ready for this? Punish you. Straight up punish you. So that's where we sit. So here's a question for you, the audience, watching and listening. I just want you to answer it for yourself where you are as you listen or watch. Do you believe that casual conversation at work in the office has become a minefield? Now, some of you may go, well, I don't think so, Ken. And that's going to be a great, great um, marker that you are in a very healthy culture. You might be not only in a healthy culture, you might be um, surrounded by people that share a lot of values. That's fantastic. Okay? I think the numbers say that it is true. Now, this is a 2019 survey. So imagine, this is four years ago, this study... 63% of U.S. employees, regardless of gender or seniority, feel they cannot share an idea, opinion, or concern at work. Now, this has some context to it, but it is very relevant to what we're talking about. The context here is they don't feel like they could speak up in a meeting, so they're not, you know, they don't feel seen or heard, and that's uh, that's that's a problem. That's not healthy, Okay. But it's also any old opinion about anything in life. Because watch, the number one reason why 63% of employees felt like they couldn't share something at work, they didn't want to seem combative. Now, a person who says, I don't speak up because I don't want to seem combative is probably a person that wouldn't come across as combative. Here's what I know. I'm a uh, recovering confrontationalist. I like confrontation. I think it's healthy. 
I think it needs to be done the right way. And when I'm off, I'll admit it. All right. But my point is this. (laughs) I rarely am worried about coming across as confrontational or combative because I like a good old, let's have a good in a meeting. Let's, I I disagree. And, and, and I want to watch myself and guard myself. And I have a lot of areas to grow here and I am raw around the edges. Let me just tell you folks, I'm an intense dude. Sometimes it's, it's, I don't say it the right way. My point is this. A person who is worried about coming across as combative is rarely going to come across as combative. So what does that tell me? What that tells me is is that the workplace has become a bubble where people are afraid of stepping on someone's toes on any comment. No one wants to be the jerk. Even the jerk doesn't want to be a jerk. You realize this? They don't want to be a jerk. They're not in a healthy place, and therefore they are hurting and they hurt people. But 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 they don't want to do this. And you who are not hurting, you certainly don't want to hurt others. All right. So now we now we take in the cancel culture where you're sitting around having a conversation. Someone else lobs a conversation point in. It may be about a social issue, maybe about a political candidate, it may be about whatever. A television show, a movie. You start talking about the character, the nuances, or there's a problem, there's a social, and all of a sudden everybody starts to get really nervous. Why? Because we are afraid of offending someone. Not because we are in any way being untoward, but we just don't know what anybody's going to say or do. They can look you right in the eye, smile at you, and then go behind your back and go, they said something that offended me. Cancel culture has created this license to punish someone over something that they said. So it leaves us with two options in the workplace. The first option is we withdraw. I go in, I do my job, I don't interact with anybody beyond what is A to B to C to D. I don't involve myself in any water cooler or cafeteria conversations or hanging out in the hallway. I just withdraw because I don't want to put myself in that position. The second option is we withdraw into small cliques of like-minded people. So both of these on the surface are safe, right? I put myself in a padded room. I don't talk to anybody about anything other than just work stuff. All right, that's one option. The other option is is I find other people and and I can talk openly with them. But now I become a part of a clique and it's very obvious. Oh, there are the so-and-sos, right? And you're defined and people know it creates more separation. So the point I'm making is, is that if those are your two approaches to just withdraw, then what happens is, is you are limiting your ability to connect. So what do we do? First, there's a sense here that I think you're going to have to be courageous. In other words, be brave and and say, you know what? I'm going to pursue connection and relationship. And I'm not saying you got to be BFFs, but I'm going to pursue connection and then relationship with my leader and my coworkers. I'm going to put myself out there knowing that it may not go the way that I would like. It might be a winding path. It might fall flat on its face, but I'm going to be brave enough to put myself out there and make no mistake. I'm using the word brave and courage on purpose because this is a form of relationship risk. Just like it's risky to ask a person out on a date. Are they going to say yes? Are they going to say no? You know, um, this is risky to put yourself out there. But the way that you do this is you begin to carve, and I, I'm going to use, gosh, this is going to sound violent. It's not, but I'm going to use a machete like you're in the jungle and there is no path. And and we're just kind of, we're just cutting through all the underbrush and we're creating a path forward. And the way that we do that is conversationally. Look for opportunities to connect. When you're interacting with a teammate or your leader, um, find moments, even though we've got an agenda, yes, and we've got to get to the meeting, but find moments. Look for moments to interject a question about them personally. And this is, again, I've taught a lot on this on the show, but this is just showing some basic interest. And you begin to just knock down some of your fears, maybe some of their fears about stuff. And again, 
if, if you're in a situation, all of a sudden the topic gets weird and you're like, uh-oh, this could be a, a landmine. You know what you do? Smile and nod. Don't engage. Okay? But if you're sitting in a situation, you, you, know, you always have the opportunity to redirect the conversation. Steered another way. Something more fun, personal, you know? Or, hey, I'm not, I'm not involved in this situation. I got a call. I got, you know, whatever. And I remove myself. It does not mean that you remove yourself from connection. So you got to cut a path towards your teammates and your leader by simply finding commonalities and values and things that you can connect on and have conversation on that steer clear of landmines. Well, Ken, what do I do? If I'm if I'm having this kind of conversation and something comes up and they they drop something out there and they say something with some fervor and I don't agree with it. It's a great question. What do you do? What you got to do is is ask them. Just go, you know, I don't know. I don't uh, why do you feel that way? Redirect it back to them. They love their own opinion. We don't have to run to the corners like cockroaches when the light comes on. We don't have to run away. Hey, redirect it back at them. Well, Ken, it irritates me. I can't stand what they believe. I got it. But guess what? They brought you into it. You're into it now. How do you stay in the moment and not run from them and create this boundary? Very simple. Redirect it back to them. Well, you know, I don't know how I feel about it. Or, yeah, I may have a different But what do you feel? Why do you feel that way? Now, this is what's interesting about this. What could be a landmine, if you start acting awkward or you allow it to create division, could end up be uh, could end up being a indirect route to connection. Because if they have any sense at all, they could go, I don't, I don't know that they agree with me on that, but boy, they they just kind of redirected it back at me. They 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 kind of sidestep that and 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 I see what they're doing here. They're not, you're not taking a position, and I don't want to do this. So I'll tell you what, I'll seek to understand your position. Really, why do you, what, what, what do you think shapes that? What's, what's the underlying philosophy there? You know, hey, and now all of a sudden, they begin to realize that you might very well disagree with them. They're not quite sure how and where, but they also realize that you respect their opinion and in doing so, you respected them in that conversation, and you gained some understanding about how they're wired, and now you realize, okay, there's something below the surface here. I may disagree with it, but I don't have to fight. And then keep building this way. Keep building this technique to ask other people about what they're interested in and what their hobbies are and what their interests are. And again, this is how we develop connection. Could be on the just the smallest of things. Oh, we love Star Wars movies. Great. And so now we are able to avoid landmines, not get involved in, in the stuff you're worried about, social, political, religious issues in the workplace. But what we are finding is, is they would rather talk to us about the fact that we like Star Wars. And all of a sudden, this fear of connecting and conversating because you're worried about stepping on landmines, you go, oh, this is pretty easy. I can kind of sashay between the landmines with some confidence. And that's what I want you to get out of this. I'll give you an example of my own life. Uh, years ago, um, Stacy and I were living in the Atlanta area, and uh, a group of guys, um, we all decided that we were going to get together, and it was, it, was a, it, was, it was a good men's group. It wasn't a Bible study, but we would talk about our faith. Um, it was more of a, hey, we're— we're trying to be on purpose in our life. We were all in similar areas of life as far as age. And, and we're like, let's just get together. And we would go to this local restaurant and we would have some food and beverage and we would have intentional discussions. It wasn't just, hey, did you see, uh, you know, John Wick this week? It wasn't that. And sometimes it would be faith-based. It would be philosophical. It would be, well, what happened was, is this one guy in the group who, uh, he, he, he had a very different uh, set of beliefs than most of us and absolutely confrontational and, and loved to provoke. Well, he had this ability to serve me a topic, Alex, 
and, and he would put it right in front of me. You know what I would do? Swallow it whole. He just, he was good at it. He knew. Uh, Ken doesn't agree with me, and he is loaded. He's loaded. If I fire it at Ken, he's firing it back. Now, how do I know this? Because he told me after about the third or fourth night. When we when we got in, and I realized what was happening. And I realized that I was getting uncomfortable because he was provoking me, and I didn't, I shut down. I would fire back a little bit, but I realized what was going on. I was like, I, we're not here to debate, and I don't even want to get into this conversation because it makes me so uncomfortable. So what did I do? After about two or three times, I realized, huh, I'm not going to win. So I just started asking him more and more questions about why he believed what he believed, and we ended up coming up with a lot of interesting topics where he and I agreed on certain philosophies. You can win people over with healthy conversations.